What makes planets and stars spherical? What causes the spherical shape of all massive celestial bodies? Is there any sizable astronomical objects that are non-spherical? As long as they are tiny enough, celestial objects can have strange and irregular shapes. However, there is a point beyond which every object tends toward a spherical shape, determined by mass. Above this point, in fact, the cohesive force of the bigger surface structures is defeated by the force of gravity, and any major prominence is drawn toward the center of gravity with a force great enough to destroy it. The celestial body's shape therefore tends to become increasingly spherical as mass and, consequently, the surface force of gravity increase. The sphere is a geometric abstraction, thus there will inevitably be minute imperfections. However, is that all there is to it? Let's together research this. What is the total number of planets in the universe? A lot. Approximately one sextillion is the estimate. Do you understand the value of an octillion? A lot actually. A figure, a billion trillion, that is so enormous that it is impossible to visualize it in your head. To give you an idea, consider the fact that the Earth weighs nearly an octillion times more than a walnut. The objects that make up this infinite space, however, all share the property of being spherical. No cuboid, dodecahedron, or heart-shaped ones exist, to mention a few. But why? First of all, it is important to clarify that we are not discussing celestial objects, but rather planets. The term celestial bodies generally refers to a wide range of things with varying properties and shapes that, for a variety of reasons, can also deviate significantly from the spherical one. Take our galaxy, the Milky Way, for instance, which has a disc-shaped structure rich in gas and stars amid a so-called halo of stars spread in a more or less spherical form. On the other hand, it is accurate to claim that the most common shape is roughly spherical if by celestial body we refer to specific objects, such as stars or planets. The explanation is likewise rather obvious. The gravitational pull, which is the force that causes the constituents of matter to be drawn to each other and eventually to the center of the expanding body, is what causes all the most massive planetary objects, whether they be stars or planets, to form. And if a great number of particles are drawn to a single site of aggregation, they can only result in a spherical agglomeration in the end. The final outcome will resemble a perfect sphere more closely the larger the mass being constructed is, and the lower its density. The underlying physical principle is the same as the one that causes soap bubbles to be spherical or fat bubbles and broth to be circular. Nature always opts for the shape that uses the least amount of energy. In actuality, the sphere has the least surface area of any solid for a given volume. Because of this, the soap bubble usually assumes an exact spherical shape. In actuality, it makes an effort to arrange itself into the configuration that requires the least amount of energy to maintain itself. Returning from soap bubbles to planets, we can state that extremely strong gravity prohibits any surface roughness from rising above a particular height. For instance, it can be demonstrated that mountains higher than 10 kilometers, which would lead them to gradually shrink in size, cannot exist on Earth. Therefore, given its mass, the Earth could never have a more asymmetrical form than it has, barring the brief period required to level out the irregularity. The maximum surface roughness on neutron stars, stars whose extremely high mass and density make the surface gravity a hundred billion times more powerful than what we experience on Earth, is thought to not be greater than half a centimeter in height. It would be as if there were no mountains on our planet that were taller than five meters if the dimensions were compared to the scale of the Earth. The so-called hydrostatic equilibrium is the level that preserves an object with the physical specifications to be referred to as a planet almost precisely spherical. When the push caused by material compression within it balances off the gravitational force that pulls matter toward the center, the condition is reached. 
The idea of hydrostatic equilibrium also enables one to distinguish between tiny celestial objects like asteroids, comets, and planets from dwarf planets. Let's not forget that planets and dwarf planets must mandatorily have a spherical shape and have attained hydrostatic equilibrium in accordance with the revised definitions for our solar system published in 2006 by the International Astronomical Union. But how heavy must something be to reach hydrostatic equilibrium? What it is built of, specifically the density of its upper layers, will determine how dense it is. Gravity is, in actuality, a relatively weak force. Before an object's gravitational attraction is powerful enough to overcome the resistance of the material it is comprised of, it must be extremely large. You don't need to worry that your bodies will suddenly collapse into a spherical shape because of this, incidentally. Let's attempt to organize it, nevertheless. Even though there are several variables that affect how an object is shaped, only three categories ultimately outline the issue. Objects with a diameter of about 400 kilometers such an object will be able to take on a spherical shape if it has a snowball density, or roughly 1 gram per cubic centimeter. For instance, Mimas, the seventh satellite of Saturn and the largest in the solar system, has a diameter of 396 kilometers. Due to its extremely low density, it is also the smallest celestial body known to have a spherical shape, 1.15 grams per cubic centimeter. This illustration highlights the difference between being spherical and being in hydrostatic equilibrium, two key distinctions. Mimas gravity cannot remove the scar left by the collision that formed the sizable crater that gives it the black death appearance. Therefore, just being spherical isn't enough to turn you into a planet, you also need to reach hydrostatic equilibrium. Similar sized objects with higher densities will display more or less asymmetrical forms. Like Pallas and Vesta, two huge asteroids in the main belt that, while having diameters much greater than 500 kilometers, exhibit a form that is far from spherical due to their extremely high density. Objects roughly 1,000 kilometers in diameter while a spherical form is typically guaranteed by this size, hydrostatic equilibrium is not. The object's general shape will likely suffer if it is thick and experiences a significant distortion event, such as an impact, as gravity would likely fail to seal the wound. Surprisingly, Jupiter, the odd moon of Saturn, has the largest known body that is not in hydrostatic equilibrium, with a diameter as large as 1,470 kilometers. In spite of its low density, which should make it simpler to obtain a spherical shape, its silhouette is defaced by an uninterrupted mountain range around the equator. Unbroken and incredibly enigmatic, its origin is unknown. What is the smallest spherical object in the solar system that is in hydrostatic equilibrium, on the other hand? It is the dwarf planet Ceres, the biggest asteroid, with a diameter of 940 kilometers. The trans-Neptunian objects Orcus, 916 kilometers, Salacia, 846 kilometers, Quaor, 1,120 kilometers, Gongong, 1,230 kilometers, and Sedna appear to be other spherical objects of this size in the hydrostatic equilibrium, 995 kilometers. Objects with a diameter of about 1,500 kilometers with the exception of Jupiter, all objects that are this size or larger turn out to be perfectly spherical and balanced. All of the huge moons of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as Titania and Oberon of Uranus, Triton of Neptune, Pluto, Eris, and of course our own moon, belong under this category. In summary, there are approximately 30 spherical objects, including the Sun, that also meet the balance criteria. Then there are, literally, millions of tiny bodies that resemble flying mountains and have incredibly diverse shapes, such as the small asteroid Itakawa that was discovered in 2005 by the Japanese probe Hayabusa or comet churyumov gerasimenko that was visited in 2015 by the Rosetta probe. And that's without even mentioning objects whose shape defies categorization. And as it passed through our solar system, the interstellar visitor Umiwamua sprang to mind because of how menacingly large and threatening it appeared to be. 
or pan, a little moon of Saturn tucked away among its rings, with its puzzling flying saucer shape. Practically, gravity's merits and disadvantages are equal. But gravity is not the only factor. The speed of their rotations works to flatten planets while gravity conspires to make them spherical. A celestial body's equatorial bulge increases in disproportion as its rotational speed increases. Because of this, our solar system only contains oblate spheroids rather than complete spheres. Jupiter would be perfectly spherical if it did not rotate, but unfortunately it does, and as a result, its equatorial diameter is 10% bigger than its polar diameter due to this. The most spherical planet is Venus, which spins in 243 days very slowly around its axis. Saturn rotates similarly. Even the Sun can be regarded as a perfect sphere due to its enormous gravity and relatively moderate rotational speed of 25 days, yet a substantial portion of stars in the sky rotate much quicker and swell noticeably near the equator. The case of a Kerner, the tenth brightest star in our sky, serves as an example because it rotates in two days as opposed to our Sun's approximately 27-day cycle. The star is much bigger and more massive, which results in an equatorial velocity of at least 250 kilometers per second, which is 125 times faster than the sun. This just makes problems worse. If you went any faster, the star would explode. Due to the high centrifugal force produced by this great speed, the star flattens, resulting in an equatorial diameter that is 56% larger than the polar one and is 11 times that of the sun. However, when it comes to flattening stars, it is in good company, among them are Regulus, Altair, and the very well-known Vega, as well as a large number of strange rotating stars. Red supergiants like Betelgeuse and other massive stars may have a roughly spherical shape, but they also have significant surface changes caused by the convective rise of hot gas, which causes enormous, irregularly shaped bubbles to form on their surfaces. Finally, I'd want to bring up galaxies once again. Because of their rotation, they too exhibit a wide variety of shapes. If their global rotational motion were zero, they would resemble globes, much like globular clusters and spheroidal elliptical galaxies do. In short, there is no a dull moment in space. Don't you agree? Thanks for watching.